Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Feinberg with The Hollywood Reporter, and it is a true honor and privilege. That's something you hear a lot, but I mean it tonight to have one of our greatest actors in this business, now or ever, with us to do a q and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Rami Malek. Please, thank you. That's very gracious. How kind. Thank you for coming on a rainy day. You've been getting a lot of that lately, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. No. It doesn't get old, though, right? No. I'll, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, for, uh, that's, that's for Freddie, and uh, I guess for myself as well. Absolutely. But a whole heap of people who worked on this film and this music, I, I think it does that to so many people. I know it does. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are going to get into this movie and the performance, but I thought people who are, maybe some people here today are, have not yet discovered Mr. Robot or some of your other past work, and I just want to get into uh, a little bit about how we got here. So uh, it's going to be a little bit of a different kind of a, a Q&A than probably m most. Uh, let's just start. Where are you from? Where were you born and raised? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, grew up, I grew up here. I grew up in, in Sherman Oaks on the border. Yeah. How about that? Which is funny because our producer, when he was asked uh, by, by the band Queen, Brian May and Roger Taylor, he said, well, I found, I found our Freddie, and he's a Brit, too. And I said, where, where, where is he from? And he's a Sherman Oak. <laughs> well, you, uh, you are actually of Egyptian descent, right? Your folks are both from Egypt. Um, yeah. How do you think that shaped you as a kid growing up? Oh, wow. You're gonna We're going to go deep. Let's do it. We're here, right? Yeah. Let's go. Um, well, it was, it was difficult because it was great in one sense is that I had this heritage and culture in, that uh, was just in my blood. I'm obviously from the very beginning. Uh, Arabic was actually my first language. So, um, yeah, once, I think my parents got a little freaked out once we started to say yes and no and... Uh, begin uh, learning English as a family, and that slowly uh, took over as uh, we got older, of course. But uh, it was something we spoke at home uh, for the most part, or at least listened to our parents yeah. speak in Arabic, and uh, we'd go to a Coptic church on Sundays with incense burning for four hours, and uh, I just thought, wow. The, the other kids at school are not doing this. That's right. <laughs> uh, and the other kids at school are not doing a lot of things that my family was doing. But I love the traditions. I love the heritage. And uh, it, was, it was a very unique way of growing up. And thank God it you know, was in a very diverse place like Los Angeles where at I could at least see some other people that were, were different in that sense, yeah. that I didn't feel like the absolute odd man out and acting as you know just in terms of discovering it in your life that was it you weren't like a kid who was uh, a theater kid up until about high school right yeah. what what was the what got you hooked well i mean talking about the the heritage and everything i mean parents uh, so many parents just want their kids to be obviously lawyers and doctors and whatnot. <laughs> so acting was never even an option or a thought. Anything like that yeah. would be just extremely radical and uh, not the reason why they would say they came to America in the first place. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, my dad always, we, we would watch CNN and old movies quite a bit. And one thing he's you know, always impressed upon me was uh, you have this ability to do something special. You just thought maybe in politics or something to that effect. So I did take this debate class in high school. I think I told you this before. I love yeah. it. That's great. Uh, and at one point, my teacher said, well, you're, you're not very good at the debate part. But <laughs> there is something that is a, that you can do a humorous interpretation or a dramatic interpretation. And I did, uh, he handed me this play called Zoo Man and the Sign. And uh, I went home and I read it. And it was, it was a one-man show, and 
all of a sudden, after reading the first page, I could feel myself almost you know, just becoming this other human being. And I remember saying, my, you know, my name is Zooman, Z-O-O-M-A-N, I'm from the bottom. And I was 13 years old and, you know, affecting some character that uh, I just didn't know I could pick up so quick. I went back to him a few days later and he's like, what did you think? And I go, well, you know, I have this memorized and I can show it to you. And he was shocked. Uh, and he saw it and then he entered me in this competition and, and about... A couple of weeks later, I was performing it in front of my mom and dad, and for the first time, I saw a visceral reaction from them seeing me do something that was so foreign to them. Uh, and it was just emotional. It was an emotion I got from, from my father in particular that I'd never felt before, and I thought, oh, well, that's <laughs> different. Uh, so maybe there's something to be done with this stuff. And so you go off, you get your BFA, you move to New York like many other actors, and like many other actors, it was not easy right out of the gate. Uh, but I love the story, and I think others will as well, of, of how you basically took things into your own hands with uh, leading to Gilmore Girls. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I went to New York, and I was at one point sleeping with the uh, two other actors in a one bedroom apartment. And yeah, that didn't last for very long. But I mean, that's what you did. You just had a futon in, in somebody's kitchen and, and that's, that's how it was actually. Uh, and then finally I said, you know, I'm from Los Angeles. I should just go back there and see uh, if, that, if it could be a little bit easier here. And it's casting director, Mally Finn. Uh, she was the one actually who would buy. She said, come to Los Angeles, something will work out for you there. And I met her, she said, get all your headshots and resumes and take them to all the film schools, leave them with anyone that you think uh, can possibly help you in this business. And so I did, I went to every film school and would just periodically dump off, dump headshots and resumes sc scattered all over the place. And uh, I would submit myself to anything I saw on backstage or, uh, that's an actor's magazine for the most part. They're actually airing our conversation. That's this is How being about filmed. That for a plug? <laughs> um, and anything online. And I remember, you know, so many times uh, uh, nobody would call back, and, and that's just the way it was. I was working at a fast food place, and I, if anybody looked any way producerial, I would slip my headshot into their to-go bag. <laughs> Seriously, uh, I mean, I was. It was. Uh, pro and it worked. I mean, I think I got an audition that way once. I'm not kidding. But uh, I did get a call one day, and it was the casting director from the Gilmore Girls, Mara Casey, and she said, um, can I speak uh, to, to Rami Malek's agent? And I said, speaking. <laughs> and she said, well... Great. Um, we'd love to have Rami come in for uh, a you know, small co-starring uh, part in the show. Um, is he a SAG actor? And I said, currently, no. <laughs> and uh, she said, all right, and you've been representing him for how long? And I said, well, quite some time now. <laughs> and she said, is this Rami Malek? And I said, actually, yes, it is. <laughs> She started to laugh a little bit, and she's like, oh, good, good luck with everything. Call me when you get, get an agent. And I said, I mean, why? I think we can cut out the middleman right now. <laughs> and she started laughing again. She's like, well, no, we got to go through the procedures and whatnot. I'm like, really? Uh, I mean, we're having such a good time. This is three <laughs> lines. I'm, I'm in Sherman Oaks right now. I went back to live at my mom's for a bit. And uh, she, I'm like, Warner Brothers is so close. I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> And she, she took a second, and she's like, she said, are you SAG? And I said, no. And I said, well, you know, that's something we can work on as well, agent and SAG. And she said, all right, come on in. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, after a couple of years of just not hearing anything back, more than a couple. But I drove over there, and I guess I, I kept making her laugh a little bit. I never thought of myself as a funny person, but... Um, <laughs> That day, I also got another call um, after my audition with her that I had, uh, someone had seen my headshot resume and it was a 
It was a actual talent agent named Defining Artists, and Kim Dore had seen it. And in, at, after the audition, I left, which was incredible that I just had the audition. I think it went fairly well. I went into Defining Artists, and I read a scene from The West Wing, and that was my first audition for a casting agent, and went back and uh, just went home, and I got a call that I was going to have a call back at Warner Brothers, and that was my, my mind was starting to explode at that point. <laughs> it just never had happened. And I went in there, uh, and I guess I did all right in there, because uh, the next day I got the job to be on the Gilmore Girls, and I also got a call that I had representation from that agent that I saw. That's so great. all of this in the span of 24 hours, I was like, quite my day. world is, has just changed. Amazing. Um, the next few years, I guess, you went through something that I, I've heard you speak about in terms of Freddie's experience of kind of figuring out your own, having to figure out your own identity um, because you now were getting work and, so, and sometimes some very high profile things, but as, as, you know, as sometimes happens in this business, there was a little bit of lack of imagination on the parts of some, and it put you in an interesting position, and I'll, I'll just give a few examples. Um, an Egyptian king, an Egyptian vampire, an Iraqi insurgent, an American terrorist. These were things that, yeah, they, you were, they were work, but I get the sense that it wasn't the kind of work you were wanting to be doing and that maybe there might have been a little bit of trepidation that you might not get ever, ever get out of that. Yeah. And one of those roles I got on, two of them are on this lot, actually. I'm thinking about it now. And there's always something that I always feel kind of off about when I'm passing these audition halls and you're going out for something that, you know, uh, somehow deep inside, there's something not sitting quite right about it. And it came to a point where I, I, I just knew that it w I didn't feel like I was doing a service to myself or, or my heritage by just portraying, especially the, the terrorist roles. I said, that's gonna be enough of that. So uh, at one point I said, I'm gonna stop doing that altogether. Told my agent, just, yeah, that's, that's in the past now. It got me to a certain place, at least it got some eyes on me, but uh, it did its service and that was, that was it. And so the, the real catapulting thing for you in, in, the, in the most positive way would have been the Pacific, right? Yeah. So this is Spielberg and Hank's mini series, limited series um, following uh, Band of Brothers and you get a major part with these heavyweights and it kind of really has gone from there, right? I mean, that was what led to working again with Tom Hanks and, and Paul Thomas Anderson and so many things from that, right? Good memory. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know if I've ever worked that so hard on an audition because I really wanted this role. I love history. I'd seen Band of Brothers, and I thought, wow, this is... This is an opportunity of a lifetime if I get to work with Hanks and Spielberg. And so I, uh, I went in to, uh, to read a few times over and over, actually. But I knew it was going well because they did keep bringing me back. Meg Lieberman did. Um, so thank you to all these casting directors, by the way. Got to give a shout out to them. Um, uh, I went, went in a few times, like I said, and finally, uh, over the course of a month, I remember uh, feeling like, I think I really have a shot at this. And myself and Joe Mazzello were brought in to read in front of Tom Hanks at his office, and it was a very dark room, and uh, sitting next to him were, seemed a, a plethora of high-profile producers and craftspeople, everybody who was going to make the final decisions here. So I was pretty nervous walking into that room. And of course, Tom Hanks stands up right away and he goes, oh, Rami Malek, I'm a big fan of yours. And I was like, I think he'd seen Night at the Museum. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I was at a loss for words at that point. I just, I looked at him and said, likewise. <laughs> And so, 
Uh, Joe Mazzello, who is, you remember from the uh, first Jurassic Park, is a uh, little boy in that. He's reading with me. You also recognize him as John Deacon in this film. We're reading together uh, this scene, and it's going pretty good. I'm feeling pretty strong about it. And usually when you have a casting ass assistant, they're, um, they're, they're usually younger for the most part. Um, and what was peculiar about this was the person operating the camcorder, who I thought was a casting assistant, was much older and uh, had a gray beard and faintly... Uh, resembled Steven Spielberg <laughs> and at one I was doing some some camera work that I thought was very elegant and a few minutes later I realized why and I just had to stop myself and say okay keep going that's Steven Spielberg that's filming you right now and he very well may be doing that in a month if this works out so uh, awesome yeah. yeah that was that was an incredible opportunity and a few days later they called and said you got the job Amazing. I couldn't believe it. And really, um, you know, just to remind people, I, I guess I would like to know how, you know, from, from, from where we were talking about five minutes ago where your career was to, in a, in a very short span, doing that project with those guys, the master with Paul Thomas Anderson, two with Spike Lee, Old Boy and The Sweet Blood of Jesus, on and on. Um, where do you think your your confidence to hold your own in, in that kind of company comes from? Oh, good question. Um, I one, I think that I was playing a I was playing a World War II Marine from Louisiana with a sl Cajun accent, and I went previous to that I had played just Middle Eastern roles, and I thought, wow, I'm playing a guy from Louisiana and pulling it off to the point where Tom who uh, oh, writes his letters on typewriter, sent me a letter at, when I was shooting in Australia. And I had put everything into, everything I could muster into this role to make it whatever, you know, everything it should be and to live up to those guys who were actually there uh, in, in World War II. God bless them all. Uh, and he wrote me this beautiful letter that he said something about, you know, the, creating this character that... I, I, has sprung to life in a way that he never thought it, it would and just didn't see it that way. And that gave me confidence, so much so that I went out and bought a typewriter just to start writing him back. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. And then, yeah, I, people saw that, which was great. I mean, thank God. And Paul Thomas Anderson saw it, and uh, he brought me in one day. Uh, I did an audition tape for him for the master reading Joaquin's part, and... He liked it, and he liked the he liked the uh, Pacific enough to have me come in and read. And uh, it's another moment. I walk in, and there's Joaquin, and I got to read with Joaquin. And I thought, okay, and one another one of those Spielberg moments where you just got to do your job. And I thought, I could do this. You know, there's no reason why I can't. And uh, I sat in the room with him, and he looked at me, and he he just said, you're. He looked at me and he could, not that I was, looked foreign to him, it was just character-wise for the role. I, do, I think he was hesitant about if I could fit into the dynamics of that family. This is Paul. This Paul, is Paul, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So in that moment, uh, he goes, man, we're going to work together. I just don't know if this is the right fit. And Joaquin kind of looks at me and I think he looks at Paul and says, damn, because we, we had good chemistry, I could tell. And... Uh, I, in that moment, I said, Paul, you make one movie like every four years. Uh, it, if it's not this one, you know, I'm, I, I, I really don't want to wait. I'd love to work with you right now. Please, yeah, please uh, give, this, give this a little bit more thought. <laughs> and, uh, and he changed his mind overnight. I got a, another call the next day where I thought it, I thought it was over. Uh, so Persistence. Persistence, yeah. yeah. Without being... I think too aggressive. Right, about right, it. right. Interesting. Well, as we uh, almost arrive at the present, there is one that I would not forgive myself for not bringing up if if uh, we went without it, and that is Short Term Twelve. Which, if you haven't seen it, go home tonight, and it'll be a great double header with this because at the time, it was I think first time feature director Destin Daniel Credin, who had made a short version of this film, 
And here's who he put in his feature. This is 2013, and uh, the cast of a bunch of nobodies who had no, no profile for anybody. Brie Larson, Lakeith Stanfield, Caitlin Deaver, John Gallagher, and Rami Malek. And for less than a million bucks, 18 days, it's one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. And I know anyone else who's seen it who I know feels the same. When you're there doing this, after some of these other higher profile ones that we've talked about, what's that like for you? Could you tell early on that it was, it was special? Yeah, re just from reading that script and talking to Destin, I knew that the, it was special. And uh, yeah, like you said, I didn't know much about Brie, Brie Larson. Uh, Keith was the, it was the first time I met him, was on set. And never, yeah, it was his first job, I believe. Oh. So uh, it, that was just a script and director moment where I, I knew that he had a, a particular vision, his own vision for the film as he wrote it. And I saw the short and I thought the short was great. And as I love working with writer directors. It's, uh, it, it gives me uh, such a feeling of trust in being in someone's hands who I think can write incredibly well and knows how to direct. And that's what, he was offering and then assembling this cast. There was just something from the beginning I knew was gonna be special and uh, every day going out and shooting with him and that cast, uh, it lived up to every one of my expectations. That's awesome, great, great movie. Um, so around the time probably of that getting out in the world, I would think is when you first heard about Elliot Alderson, a cybersecurity specialist by day and master hacker by night who grapples with psychological issues and drug addiction while trying to free the world from heartless corporations. I, 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 we have to, how do you condense? This guy's such a multifaceted guy. Um, I use that. I'll, 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 yeah. It's all yours. Uh, uh, this is, of course, on Mr. Robot with a guy who at the time had made no TV. Now he's got Mr. Robot and Homecoming, Sam Esmail. Um, how did that come to you? And at the time, was that even a big deal? That was, yeah, I mean, it was a moment where uh, he had seen me in the Pacific as well. So how about that? One gig is all it takes to get some eyes on you. And um, I, I read that and it was another phenomenal script and I just closed it and stared at it. I thought that's an odd title, but I let that go for a second. And uh, I had to go in and keep reading for him a number of times actually, even though I think, uh, yeah, we had, we knew, uh, I feel like we knew early on it was going to be us, but you, you have to show uh, all the execs and whatnot, do the, do the tests. And, uh, but that story from the very beginning uh, was something that just I latched onto, and I knew immediately who this guy was. And uh, another one where I just wanted to sink my teeth in it, go away for a long time and come back as this character. And, and you're going to be going back again in a month to do another season. Um, Final season. And we should note for that performance, um, Best Actor in a Drama Series Emmy, first non-white winner of that award in like 18 years. And um, a great, I, I think uh, neither your nor Sam's career will ever be what it was before uh, as a result of that. But all right, so coming to the main attraction of, of the night, um, you were born in 1981, Freddie Mercury died in 1991. I can't imagine that you really knew that much about him when he was alive. So what were your, you know, what did you know, know going into this project about Freddie Mercury? Oh, um, before, you, before you were approached about the project, I mean. I, I didn't know all that much. My, f my best friend has named, had named his kid Freddie Mercury and uh, that was two years before I got the job. Right. So the most astonishing thing is to play with four-year-old Freddie Mercury right <laughs> now. Uh, he's just, he can't figure out how this all works yet, but he's about to. Um, the music, I, I remember hearing Bohemian Rhapsody for the first time and uh, it, it filled me with so many emotions and I could tell there was something that had far surpassed your tra traditional song. And uh, yeah, it haunted me, it affected me, but at the same time, it you know, made me want to have a laugh and, and, and physically move as well. So 
I, I just, it was so unexpected and I knew it was very special and I wanted more of their music. So I did listen to more, but I'd never seen uh, the amount of footage that I have now. Right. So now, I, I guess, how was, the, how was it even first brought to your uh, attention that there would potentially be a movie and then what was the was there a process or did they come and say you are our guy right away well they now they had seen mr robot so uh that's one thing leading to another and just to talk about that for a second yeah, sam Esmail, i gotta give this guy love he's one of the greatest art auteurs i've ever met in my life and i'm so privileged to be working with this guy we should all be so lucky and um, and talk about a small world he's also of egyptian descent right is. yeah yeah so and he didn't know that immediately no, no. When, yeah. we, when he auditioned me the first time right um where were we oh so i was on mr robot and i got a call that the producers wanted to see me so i flew out to los angeles and that's when i started doing my freddie mercury homework and just watching everything i could possibly uh, get my hands on and i thought wait they want they like mr robot and they want to see me for freddie mercury <laughs> which i i was astounded by because i mean complete opposite ends to one degree and you personally though were also Immediately interested, or did it take some thought to... Immediate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was... I questioned it, and if I could do it, but immediately interested. And I thought, well, why? I mean, I get, you get this opportunity once in a lifetime, and we dream of having uh, opportunities and roles like this. We bang on doors for so many years to be in this position, and it, quite frankly, it would be a disservice not to, to, you know, to not take it. So you get it, and then there's, you know, all this additional work that obviously, you know, uh, had to be done before the cameras rolled. I think the most amazing thing is just people, you know, who have seen you in other things or in real life or on a red carpet or whatever, clearly you are, phys your physicality is extremely different than Freddie's. Uh, forget about the hair and makeup for now, we'll come to that in a second, but just even going about life. So, and you took that very seriously. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a, a, a movement coach until I was reading about some of the things that you did to prep. Can you share with people just how much work goes into that aspect of things? Yeah, well, yeah, that was, I mean, it's now the most I've ever worked on any role is uh, for sure this one. Um, I was told, you know, I didn't have to audition for this, but at some point, Graham King and Dennis O'Sullivan had to get a studio behind them, so I did have to make a tape that was shopped around all over Hollywood, so gotta thank Fox for actually pulling the trigger on this. And before Fox had actually greenlit it, I said, Graham, uh, there is no way that you're gonna get this green light, and in two weeks we're gonna start shooting one day. Whether you have it or not, I, I need all the help I can get. So I said, I'm gonna f I just flew myself out to London immediately, put myself up, and I said, you know, whatever happens with this, it, it'll be a wash or, you know, this is what I've worked so hard to do. I'm gonna finance this on my own. Just get me a dialect coach, get me someone to help with the choreography, and he did. I sat down for the first time. I got to audition people to be a choreographer, and as, you know, they came in and talked to me, I realized, you know, it's not, it's not a choreographer I need. I'd watched Freddie so much, I thought, this guy is so spontaneous. I need, I need to be able to do exactly what he can do at any moment's time, my own way. And uh, I remember hearing that uh, Eddie Redmayne in The Theory of Everything had a movement teacher to uh, help him articulate his body as Stephen Hawking. So, I started seeking out uh, movement coaches and I sat down with this, this young woman named Polly Bennett who didn't have the same uh, resume as everyone else, but I could tell immediately that we were gonna work well together and she was so passionate and she spoke a language that I understood in terms of moving and having a theatrical background where she could help my mind uh, be introduced to movements in a way that I could understand. Because I am not, I'm not a musical person, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, I had to take singing lessons for this and piano lessons. And, you know, she'll tell you from, right from the start, 
I do not do five, six, seven, eight. I have to learn <laughs> it a completely different way. Um, well, that leads nicely into the next thing, which obviously we should talk about the the singing, because there should be no mistaking anything about like. First of all, was day, what was day one of this shoot? Day one, if you don't all know yet, because it's all over the place, was Live Aid. So the first day was that crane shot coming through the audience and wrapping around me as I sit at the piano. And uh, yeah. That right was, in the deep end. <laughs> it was right in the deep end, yeah. Um, Baptism by fire. But ultimately it was great because uh, it just galvanized us as a band, as, as a crew. Everybody felt like they had to do the toughest thing uh, first. So... Uh, from a production standpoint, it, it was great because it brought us all together, every, every person on that set, cast and crew. And so for that and all the other times that we see you singing, you're singing, yeah. and there are people there, obviously, you know, maybe they added a few more technic digitally or whatever, but, uh, and then it, it, the, it's, it's a blur, it's a blend of you and Freddie, right? Of myself, yeah, in those moments, yeah. And then uh, we, had, we had help from a guy named Mark Martell who came in and uh, did some vocals as well. But this um, uh, Paul Massey, who's done the sound on this, is he's mixed it phenomenally well. I mean, I can't tell where I start. And it's amazing. But he picks up in it. It's, it's marvelous. It's uh, totally yeah, it's a shock to me. I watch the end of Live Aid every time I can, I can manage to get here and uh, catch, the, catch at least five, ten minutes yeah. of it because it's, it's, to me, uh, seamless the way he's done it. One other kind of uh, absolutely appropriate shout-out I think we, sh we should give is to the makeup and hairstyling people that you worked with um, who have been shortlisted for an Oscar as well uh, or, you know, with, with this all. Um, what was the, you know, it, we can obviously see that it's you under there, but there are things with your teeth and all kinds of other things that were done. Can you give us a little overview of what your day was like? That's another thing I said, Graham, get me the teeth immediately. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I work with one of the most phenomenal makeup artists in the business. Her name's Jan Sewell, and uh, she's just a lifesaver for me. Uh, I never thought I would be able to look that much like Freddie. And at times, to me, there are moments where I go, wow, she did a phenomenal job. And um, she said, we have to straighten out your nose and give you more of a aquiline nose, because his, his nose is razor sharp. So she put a bridge on my nose uh, every day. Uh, and you couldn't tell. Most people couldn't tell. They knew there was something different. And for me, it helped because I could look in the mirror and see someone else. Um, and so that was about, be about two hours in the morning of hair and makeup. It was a, a wig throughout, believe it or not. Everything is wigged. I hate to demystify Because you were coming off of Mr. Coming Robot. Off yeah. Mr. Robot. So I was trying for the last two weeks. I said, don't cut my hair to my ma makeup and hair stylist on, on Mr. Robot. Uh, but it just wasn't long enough. Um, but she did, she, uh, I think, maybe six wigs she used throughout. And she's a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist. So between the two of us, uh, every day, it was an excellent combination. And uh, I can only hope to work with her in the future. And she created the looks for um, everyone in the cast as well. She, of course, had help uh, with several great makeup artists every day. But... Uh, she's one of a kind. Yeah. Well, the last thing I want to just ask you is, you're on set, and I think almost every day, uh, Brian May and Roger Taylor were there, and w I wonder what it was like having them there for that, and then also, just over a week ago, when uh, you won a Golden Globe for this performance, and they were there. Thank you. And just, they have been... They could have, th the fact that they are your biggest fans of this performance has got to be the ultimate compliment, right? I cannot believe it. I just <laughs> cannot believe that I went to the Golden Globes and sat with Brian May and right. Roger Taylor <laughs> celebrating <laughs> their best friend. Right. Uh, I mean, that was the, the greatest accolade I could have asked for prior to any of this was just having their appreciation and 
we've we've just become friends out of all of this. So uh, I think we'll be lifelong friends. And I get to, I get an in more intimate way. I thought this would be the most intimate way to get to know Freddie, and now I have them, which is just the most marvelous thing that's happened in my life. And then yeah, the Golden Globe on top of that is is beautiful and uh, more than I should ever aspire to have in my life. But I'm so proud of all of it. You should be. It's it's an amazing uh, piece of work, and it just leaves, I think, everybody that sees it more excited than ever to see what you do next. So thank you for making time for us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I appreciate it so very much. <laughs>